This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. In 1977, a trip to Lake Champlain began as an ordinary summer vacation for Sandra Mansi. It turned out to be anything but ordinary when Sandra took this remarkable photograph along the shore of the lake. Some experts believe the picture may be evidence that Scotland's famous Loch Ness Monster has an American cousin. Meet Pierre, a man without a past. In May of 1992, he wandered, confused, disoriented and penniless into a homeless shelter in San Diego. He hopes that someone watching tonight can tell him who he is and where he came from. Todd Kelly and Christy Mutzfield were high school sweethearts until Christy went away to college and began dating another man. A few months later, Todd Kelly was found murdered, apparently the victim of a lethal lover's triangle. Also tonight, a woman has been reunited with her family after she watched her own story on Unsolved Mysteries. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Hamilton, Indiana is a small lakeside resort town with just 684 permanent residents. In the summer, the population swells into the thousands thanks to vacationers looking for a tranquil escape. But on August 9, 1989, the peace and serenity of Hamilton was shattered forever. At 7 a.m., Christy Mutzfield arrived at the home of her boyfriend, 19-year-old Todd Kelly. Moments later, she fled in terror. I saw him laying on the floor, and I screamed his name, and I could just, I could just see just by looking at him that, that something was very wrong, wasn't right. Todd Kelly was dead, stabbed seven times in the chest, back, and wrist. His death hit horrifyingly close to home for Christy Mutzfield. Just hours earlier, the two lovers had been together in the same house where Todd was killed. The authorities immediately questioned Christy Mutzfeld, and the story which unfolded would eventually place her at the center of an ongoing controversy. By the end of the interrogation, a primary suspect had emerged, another man whom Christy had been dating, a man who represented the third side of a lethal lover's triangle built on the affections of Christy Mutzfeld. Christy met Todd Kelly during their junior year in high school. For Todd especially, it was love at first sight. Todd was a very kind person, very sweet. He uh, didn't hold any grudges against anyone. Todd really just cared about everybody for who they were. After graduation, he asked me to marry him. And I guess I said no. I said I really wasn't ready. I thought there was other things I really wanted to do right now. And that's pretty much where we broke it off right there. The next fall, Christy enrolled at a small college just seven miles from Hamilton. She soon began dating Mafuz Huck, a student whose parents had emigrated from Bangladesh when he was just an infant. And he was very outgoing, very energetic. He was interested in what I had to say. and. He, uh, he was interested in what I thought and what I believed in. Despite outward appearances, Mafuz Huck was not what he seemed to be. Shortly after he met Christy, Mafuz and one of his friends were arrested for three separate robberies. In one of them,
Bafu stole $100,000 worth of jewelry from his own aunt. He told me that it was all his friend, you know, his, his friend was a pro at it, you know, he'd been wanted in other states, and he pretty much laid it all off on his friend. After he was arrested and he had to go on house arrest, I guess it'd be called, he, uh, he, he, he came, became very possessive. And he said that if he ever saw me with anybody else, that they would probably kill him and then kill me. A few months later, Christy rekindled her romance with Todd Kelly, but Mafu's Huck, who lived nearby, remained very much in the picture. Two weeks before the murder, Mafu's walked the 10 miles from his house to Christie's, only to discover that she was out with Todd Kelly. Hundred more, and it's mine. Who's that? On August 7th, the day before the murder, Todd was at the home of a friend, Mike Kuhn, when Mafuz appeared unexpectedly. What can I do for you? Just want to talk to you about Christy a little bit. What would you like to know? Mafuz asked Todd if he was going to quit seeing her. And that time, Todd had told him no. <sighs> she told me she's in love with me. Their voices were never raised or nothing like that. They shook hands. I mean, and really, it just, it seemed like it was pretty much all over and done with, you know. 36 hours later, Todd Kelly was dead, and his house was swarming with police. Authorities were able to determine that Todd had died around 3.15 a.m. that same morning. Mike McClelland of the Steuben County, Indiana Sheriff's Department took charge of the investigation. He immediately noticed that the crime scene had been tampered with. It was obvious that the body had been cleaned up and then moved into the living room from another part of the house. Upon further checking of the house, we noticed that there were no sheets on the bed in the bedroom. Uh, we also discovered a spot where there was blood on the floor in the bedroom uh, by the bathroom door. It was very hard to find this at first because it had been wiped clean. We believe that the sheets were used to move the body and to clean up the crime scene. Oddly, the bed sheets have never been found. In the yard, police came across several cigarette butts. They matched the brand smoked by Mafu's Huck. Authorities also discovered that Todd's car had been wiped clean of fingerprints and the keys were missing. They theorized the killer had planned to remove the body from the scene. We discovered that the headlights of the car didn't work. I believe that the suspect was going to try and use that vehicle to transport the body. I think his efforts were foiled by the fact that he didn't know that the car wasn't working. Police were convinced that the person who held the key to the investigation was Mafu's Huck, who had now disappeared. They began to track his movements around the time of the murder. Between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. on the night of the murder, two eyewitnesses claimed to have seen Mafuz walking barefoot in the direction of Todd's house. At virtually that same moment, Christy Mutzfield and Todd Kelly were in bed at his house. I thought you wanted to. When uh, we were in bed, I heard noises outside. What's that? What? I heard a noise. I really thought that something was outside. And Todd said it was probably just a dog, because he had a dog tied up out back. And he said it was nothing to worry about. It was getting kind of late, and I told him I had to go home, because I hadn't, hadn't really been home home for quite a while, and I knew my father would be upset. So, uh, so we left, and he said he was going to stay up all night, and he wanted to get something to drink. Christy says that at 2.30 AM, she drove Todd into town. She believes Mafu's Huck entered the house while they were gone. We drove back to, my, to his house and um, said goodbye in the car. And he gave me a kiss. Don't forget to come back. I won't. I'll leave the door open. And don't forget. Christy says she dropped Todd off at approximately 3 AM. The coroner determined that Todd was murdered within 15 minutes. A 
At 4.30 a.m., Mafus Huck called Christy from his parents' house 10 miles away. Hey. Morning. What time is it? Two hours later, Mafuz showed up in her bedroom. According to Christy, she broke off the relationship for good. I've been thinking that maybe, um, well, maybe it would just be better if we didn't see each other anymore. Oh, great. Mafuz. Hope you're happy. It, it kind of scared me, the tone of voice he had, and I, I said, excuse me? He says, I hope you have a happy life. And then he walked out. At first glance, the case seemed open and shut. Ma Fu's Huck in an apparent fit of jealous rage had murdered Todd Kelly. The authorities dismissed Christy Mutzfeld as a possible suspect. But then this seemingly simple case took a surprising turn. Todd Kelly's family is convinced that there are inconsistencies in Christie's story. While they do not believe Christie was an active participant in the murder, they do question whether she has been completely honest. The Christie story is not the way that it happened. According to all the evidence that we have dug up and the evidence that the police have, there is no way that she was not there. She had to be there during the murder. When Todd and Christy returned home, and they probably started making love, and Mafus waited in the bushes. When he saw what was happening, that's when his jealousy took over, and he could no longer control himself and decided to finish the act. What was that? What? When Christy said she heard the noise, it was Mafus coming in the door. I do believe at that point, Mafus convinced her to help him cover up the murder. Christine. We do believe also at that point that Christy did help move the body. There was no drag marks on the carpet whatsoever. Mafus was not a, a large man. Todd was a good sized fellow. It would have took a lot of strength to pick him up bodily and carry him out to the other room by himself. I don't know why they want to blame me. I mean, I know Todd and I had our hardships, and I hurt him, and he hurt me, but... And I know that upset them, but I don't know why they're blaming me. The possibility of an accomplice is pure speculation at this point in time. There's no hard evidence, uh, and by the evidence given at the scene, it appears that he acted alone. Todd died approximately at 3.15 in the morning. It amazes me how a man could alone could clean up that entire room, clean up the entire mess he made, move the body, entirely clean the body, and also walk all the way back home in the amount of time that they had reported receiving another phone call. He had to have some help. It's our belief that there's a good possibility he could have made it to Hamilton and back walking. There's also the possibility, if it took him longer than what he thought at the crime scene, that he could have called someone to come and get him. The Kelly family believes that Christy is the person who gave Mafuz a ride home. In addition, they question her statement about what happened when she returned to Todd's house at 7 in the morning. She claims she did not immediately notice Todd's body, even though it was lying right by the front door a point which even Sheriff McClellan concedes is unlikely. We're not accusing Christy. The only problem is, is we feel that there's some inconsistencies in the things that she has told us. Um, we've asked Christy uh, for a polygraph examination, and she has refused to do that. All we want from her is the truth, and the whole truth, and we do not believe we're getting that from her. We do feel that possibly she could help the case out by stepping forward and telling the whole story the way it should be told. Todd's family, they've just, they've, they've been very hard on me from the beginning. They, um, they harassed me, they accused me, unjustfully accused me of, of everything. They wouldn't even let me go to his funeral. They'd, 
and it's been very accusing and and I, I realize they're hurting and I, and I don't think that they realize that I'm hurting too and that everything that they say and every time they accuse me of something it just hurts more I don't know why they're doing what they're doing <laughs> Next, the incredible tale of a primitive sea creature, America's own Loch Ness Monster, said to live in the depths of Lake Champlain. Centuries ago, along the shores of what is now Lake Champlain in upstate New York and Vermont, the Iroquois paid homage to the spirit of a great horned serpent said to rule the murky depths of the lake. The fabled sea monster which captivated the Iroquois still fascinates people today. In fact, in the past 25 years, no less than 100 eyewitnesses claim to have seen the Lake Champlain sea monster, known affectionately as Champ. Sandra Mancy, a successful antiques dealer, grew up near Lake Champlain. When she was a child, her grandfather teased her with fearsome tales of the legendary creature. Grandfather told us all about Champ, and when we would go fishing, he would say to us, if you don't sit down and behave in the boat, I'm going to throw you over and Champ's going to eat you. Of course, we didn't believe a word of it. <laughs> it wasn't anything that we really believed in. It was just a, a threat of grandfather's. And so I just really kind of dismissed it for years and years as just one of grandfather's big stories. In July of 1977, Sandra took this remarkable photograph, which fueled worldwide speculation and not surprisingly, controversy. Sandra will never forget the day she saw Champ. That summer, Sandra, her two children, and her fiance, Tony, were on vacation near Lake Champlain. Okay, just be careful. And we stopped at this one place, and we went down over a bank, and the children were down further on the beach, having a great time. And Tony decided to go back to the car and get the camera, because we hadn't taken any pictures of the children. And they were, had their shoes off, and they're waiting down on the shore. And I'm sitting there by myself, and I'm looking out at the lake, and the lake started churning. My first thought was scuba divers, but then it's too much. It would be too big of a group of scuba divers, but then fish. There's some very large sturgeon and big walleyes in Champlain, so I thought, well, it's a very, very large school of fish. And then the head and the neck came up out of the water, and then the back. And I watched it turn its head and neck and look around. And when it first came up, its mouth was open. And I could see water coming out of the mouth. But I don't remember any eyes or any details like that. Just the head and the neck and the back. And it's really, really serene. And I'm feeling like I shouldn't be there. This is something I should not be witnessing because to me, this thing should have been extinct 30 million years ago. And even then, I'm not frightened. I'm in total awe and very calm. And then Tony came back and he saw it. Heidi, get out of the water. Get out of the water right now, come on, get out and of there. And he got all panicky, screaming and hollering. Get up here, I don't know. Come on, get up there. Sandra, and he screamed thing? at me to get back there. So Sandra, he helped me up the go. bank. And, and when he did, he handed me the camera. And, and I turned around, and I'm, it's still there. And I picked up the camera and shook one shot. When Sandra had the film developed, she was certain she had taken a picture of Champ. She was equally certain that no one would believe that the photo was real. She threw away the negatives, and fearing public ridicule, kept the picture hidden for the next two years. 
hope you don't think I'm crazy with all this stuff I've been telling you about. No, not at all. Finally, in the autumn of 1979, Sandra had the snapshot blown up into an 8 by 10 inch no, print. Sorry, so at the urging of friends, she contacted Joe Zarzinski, who spent more than a decade researching a book on the Lake Champlain sea creature. Yeah, well, here. Here's a photograph. This is a great picture. Yeah. When I opened it up, I thought it was too good to be true. Uh, after putting in so many years of, of researching uh, field work, and then finally there was this color photograph that clearly depicted a, a head and neck sticking out of the water. Uh, and it was almost as if all my Christmases came to me at once. Can you point out on the map where you think the sighting was? Well, where yeah. Occurred? I know it was at the north end of the lake. Um, Unfortunately, Sandra was unable to pinpoint the exact part of the lake where she had taken the photograph. Yeah. Joe sent the print to the University of Arizona to be analyzed. This is a great picture. Yeah. We digitized it and run all sorts of computer enhancement uh, techniques. We, we were looking like for pulleys or ropes or anything like that, superimpositions. But we found no evidence of hoaxing. And we concluded that that object, whatever it is, was there in the lake at that estimated distance. It wasn't any sort of superimposition. When the photograph was released, it caused a media sensation. The New York Times and Life magazine carried the story. Many were reminded of another, far more well-known creature, the legendary Loch Ness Monster of Scotland. Some speculated that if such creatures did exist, perhaps they were prehistoric animals which had somehow managed to survive. Well, the object in the Mansi photograph resembled a plesiosaur, which is an aquatic reptile from the Cretaceous about 60, 70 million years ago, long neck and flippers. It resembles that, um, but that's, that's a long time to have survived. Another theory maintains that Champ might be a Zooglodon, a snake-like whale extinct for 20 million years. Or perhaps Champ was simply a lake sturgeon, which had been known to reach seven feet in length. No matter the explanation, the fact remains that following the publication of the Mansi photograph, dozens of eyewitness sightings were reported. Near dusk on July 7, 1988, Walter Tappan, his wife Sandy, and daughter Heidi went out on Lake Champlain with a camcorder. The previous day, Walter and Heidi believed they had seen Champ. The Tappans were probably 10 to 12 miles from the area where Sandra Mansi had taken her photograph 11 years earlier. It was a quiet night, just as still as glass, like the first night had been. And I was full of anticipation and excitement, but also not necessarily expecting anything. And for about 10 minutes, we saw nothing. And then Sandy, curiously enough, Sandy says, Walt, Walt, I think I see one. Get the camera, honey, get the camera. I was manning the camera all the time. And uh, when you look through the viewfinder, you can't see much. And uh, so we had quite a time there where my daughter and my wife were saying, there, there, look, look. And I'd say, where? I can't see anything. Where? Walter and his family believe that they saw not just one creature, but several. What he photographed is visible in the center portion of the screen. We saw frequently a series of small humps coming up, breaking the surface, gliding along, and then subsiding again. But we watched these creatures for 45 minutes. And at one particular moment, um, they spotted, Heidi and I think spotted one not far from the boat, at the most 50 or 60 feet from the boat. And then began the footage uh, for about 20 or 30 seconds of seeing these humps glide along first two, then three, then four, and then suddenly five, all in a row, stretching out about 20 feet. Oh, my God. Uh, at one time, I saw, I would say, five in the community. But throughout the night, I, I had went on for about an hour. I had probably, um, I would say, seven different sightings of them. Oh, my gosh, Heidi, do you see another one? 
And then I became very worried about it because my husband had seen it the night before and now we see it again. I thought maybe this is some sort of nesting site, but I didn't know what it was. And I kept trying to make sense out of it. It's bigger, it's even bigger, they're more hot. So I got, we have a sun deck on the back. So I decided to climb up and stand on the sun deck and I just scan the water like that, back and forth scanning. And lo and behold, I saw one of those Brahma bull humps coming along the water, and then all of a sudden, the neck and the head came up, and it looked right at me. I, I will never forget it. And so, as I said, it just happened like that. All of a sudden, there's this lead hump, like the Brahma bull hump. All of a sudden, just like this, just so gracefully, just like that, looked out, looked at me, and I, and I was screaming with excitement, which I wish I wasn't doing because it went down more rapidly came back and then very gracefully, very slowly, went back down into the water just like that. And this was the movement, you know, just up and down. There was no time for me to get the camera and refocus. I'd give anything now to have that on footage because uh, what Sandy saw was, of course, an astounding thing, this creature looking at us and lifting its head out of the water. And what it did uh, was to confirm absolutely for all of us that what we had seen was champ. Scientific opinion is varied, but at least one expert believes that what Walter Tappan photographed was nothing more than a school of fish. Perhaps he is right, but who can explain the Mansi photograph or the hundreds of eyewitness accounts recorded through the centuries? Do I believe champ exists? You'll never convince me of anything else you can call it champ, you can call it a monster, you can call it a zooglodon, you can call it a plesiosaur, you can call it anything you want. I'm telling you, in that lake, there is something extraordinary. I think there's a good chance that there's something in Lake Champlain that still remains unknown to zoology. Something large, something unknown, and for that reason, if for no other, we should continue trying to find out what it is. When we return, the story of a young man who claims that he has lost almost all memory of his past. Imagine waking up one day with no sense of who you are, where you are, or where you came from. That is exactly what happened to a mysterious young man named Pierre, who seems to be suffering from near total amnesia. His odyssey began when he awoke in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by the fog and mist of a forgotten past. Those first few minutes, you're literally nothing, and you feel so empty. It's very lonely and painful to be empty. I'm so sorry if the voice shakes and I stutter more than usual, but it's not nice to, to talk about these things. It was a chilly, windswept morning in May of 1992. Pierre says he inexplicably found himself along a deserted stretch of coastline with a blue duffel bag beside him. Feeling weak, hungry, and terribly confused, Pierre recalls that he made his way to the road, Highway 1 leading south from Big Sur, California. So I started walking, and as I came upon, a, well, you could call it a village if you're polite, but it's a very small, small place. It's called Gigorda. I saw the sign. Pierre spotted a telephone, his first chance to obtain help. Only then did it dawn on him that he had no one to call. Then I realized I couldn't phone anybody. And that's when I realized that I didn't know anybody, including me. Alone and distraught, Pierre searched through his belongings. Tucked into one of his shirts was a crumpled piece of paper, a library card from the Boston Public Library. Handwritten on the back of the card was a name, April, comma, Pierre. Pierre says now that it was not his signature. Well, it struck me that 
hey, that's the, the name of whoever owns that card, and that must be me. It's in my belongings. It's with my socks. It's with my shirts. It's with my things. Pierre claims he was plagued by hazy memories of San Diego, California, 400 miles to the south. With just $17 in his pocket, he set out hitchhiking. Three days later, Pierre arrived in San Diego. He wandered through the streets of the city, searching for a recognizable landmark. I was not so much f frightened anymore as angry because I was so sure everything would come back. But I saw downtown and said nothing. I looked at the building and they meant nothing. I was so sure this city would bring everything back and it did not. And uh, I walked the streets of the city for a long time. Pierre felt he was hovering on the brink of madness. Finally, a sympathetic bus driver gave him a free ride to the St. Vincent de Paul homeless shelter. We've had cases of people pretending they didn't know who they were. But Pierre was very unique in that sometimes in, in the other cases, the residents are after something. They, they want to kind of uh, use staff to get some needs met of theirs. And that wasn't Pierre's case at all. He didn't ask for anything. He didn't even ask for help. And hold your breath. In the past six months, Pierre has undergone a battery of physical and psychological examinations. Doctors theorize he may be suffering from trauma-induced amnesia. The doctor here at the facility did screen Pierre and found no obvious physical causes or reasons for the amnesia. Uh, and he did say that the case was very unique from his perspective in that it's very rare to have somebody lose their long-term memory for as long as Pierre has. While at St. Vincent's, Pierre began the painstaking search for clues to his past. Soon, fragments of his former self began to emerge. Pierre apparently has considerable knowledge of physics, advanced math, and computers, and even claims he knows how to fly an airplane. Pierre also discovered that he possesses some artistic ability. But other clues only served to deepen the mystery. In the blue duffel bag was a neck brace. Pierre believes that he may have been injured while playing hockey. He also claims that he can type 85 words a minute. Pierre also found that he has a talent for music and learned how to play the guitar in just a few hours. Now, every morning, Pierre travels to Balboa Park in San Diego, where he earns spending money as a street entertainer. Well, it gives me an identity, for one thing. I'm a musician. Now I'm something. I don't feel empty now, because I keep myself very, very busy. Hoping to add detail to Pierre's fragmented memories, Unsolved Mysteries arranged for him to consult with a police sketch artist. In the session, two portraits were created, portraits of people who may have been significant in Pierre's past. The first was a man who Pierre believes is his cousin, Luke, nicknamed Curly. According to Pierre, Luke is an auto mechanic who once fixed the tour bus of a well-known group of Louisiana musicians, the Preservation Hall Jazz Band. The second drawing was a woman who Pierre believes was once his employer. Her name is Carol. Pierre recalls that they worked together in a business office. But for every memory which returns, Pierre says there are literally thousands which remain buried and, uh, and forgotten. I, I just want to find out what the past is, if I can. If I try to remember something too hard, I get a beautiful headache that I wouldn't want to inflict on my worst enemy. And most recently, like those last few days, if I try not to remember something that's coming back, I get the same thing. Like some lumps of things come back that are not especially pleasant. And uh, if I try to block them out, I get the same kind of headache. It's a hazy, piercing pain that engulfs the whole head. It's not something nice. 
It's something I can do without. Update. On the night of our broadcast, a viewer in Canada called our telecenter to say that the young man had once worked for his wife and that his name is, in fact, Pierre April. Pierre soon learned that he has two sisters and that his parents live in Lachine, Canada, where his father practices medicine. The next day, they spoke on the phone for the first time in more than five months. It was a very emotional moment. And then I even had to tell him that I couldn't even trust him 100%, that I wanted the package with family pictures in it and with my birth certificate in it and anything else he could think of. He said, OK, we'll send that to you. And then he said, do you remember your mom? And I said, no. And she was listening on the extension. And she burst into tears. A few days later, the packet arrived. Pierre sat down with his fiancée, whom he met in San Diego, and a friend, to get reacquainted with his past. It is strange to be told who you are and what you did. I'm someone again. And for quite a few months, I was nobody and nothing. Next, the heartwarming reunion of a woman and her family. On a previous broadcast, we profiled the case of a woman named Lorene Roberts, who mysteriously vanished in 1962 and had no idea that she was one of the heirs to a million dollar estate. In a happy turn of events, Lorene herself was watching television on the night of our broadcast and saw her own story on Unsolved Mysteries. Uh, I'll be with you in just a minute, okay? In 1951, Lorene Roberts was 16 years old and working as a waitress in Austin, Texas, when she fell in love. Coffee, pie, and how about I take you for a whirl? Lorene and the young service man were married just 10 days after they met. By 1956, the couple had two sons and a daughter, but the marriage was on the rocks. When her husband filed for divorce, Maureen was left to raise the children on her own. Will you be in charge for mommy? Will you do that for me? God, I gotta go now, I gotta go. Will you watch after them for me, okay? Maureen tried. She worked and she tried to handle, you know, her situations. And she loved her children very much, but that was just something she couldn't handle, and she seen she couldn't handle it. And she tried to get help from her husband, but no help. Finally, Lorene felt she had no choice but to give her children up for adoption. The decision left Lorene shattered, and her emotional state grew increasingly fragile. Finally, in 1957, the stress became too great, and Lorraine was admitted to a state mental facility. Take care now. OK, you too. Two years later, while on furlough from the facility, Lorraine paid a short visit to her sister, Ruby. No one in the family ever heard from her again. In 1988, Lorraine became one of the heirs to a million-dollar estate after the death of her mother. An extensive search was launched, but there was no sign of Lorene Roberts. When we aired the story, we never imagined that Lorene would call our telecenter and solve her own mystery. Lorene's family was overjoyed to learn that she was alive and well. Her sister, Ruby, immediately flew to Little Rock, Arkansas, where Lorene had been working as a housekeeper for just room and board. A few days later, Ruby brought Lorene back home to Austin, Texas for a poignant reunion with the rest of her family. It was unbelievable. I could hardly believe it because I guess for so long we had searched and searched for her and we couldn't find a lead. I was so enthused, I just, I cried, I laughed, I did everything. Mm. 
Yes, it's nice to be back. They're real nice. They've always been. They're original people that said that are very darling people. <laughs> After we filmed this reunion, Lorene remained in Austin for three months. She received her $105,000 inheritance and has since returned to her home in Arkansas. This is the wonderful person we looked for for 30 years. We're going to try to be happy and just do all the things we can to be together and love each other and, and include her children and her grandchildren. And which I think will be real good for Lorraine and all of us. From time to time, the authorities contact us with fast-breaking cases, hoping that an urgent appeal to our viewers may help solve them. Our first special alert tonight is a tragic story of a woman who was kidnapped and later murdered by her husband. Joseph and Lois Krantz of Kalamazoo, Michigan, had been married for 14 years, none of them easy. Joseph had been in and out of prison since the mid-1970s for offenses ranging from burglary to fraud to forgery. On July 31, 1992, he was released from jail after serving two and a half months for embezzlement and parole violation. At the time, his wife Lois was pregnant with a couple's third child but she had recently contacted legal aid about seeking a divorce. On August 5th, less than a week after his release, Joseph Krantz showed up at Lois's apartment brandishing a gun. A friend, Janice McCrae, was with Lois that morning. She went into the bedrooms to get some stuff. We went into the living room, We, me and the kids. While we were sitting there, Lois come running out of the bedroom yelling, oh no, oh no, you know, just screaming. Krantz forced his wife into a car and sped away. That night, he called his mother and told her that he had killed Lois and dumped her body near a lake about 30 miles from Kalamazoo. Three days later, Lois Krantz's body was found in the general area her husband had described. She had been shot once in the head. On August 12, 1992, Lois Krantz was laid to rest. Her two daughters are now with relatives in a place where they will be safe from their father. Joseph Krantz has not been seen since he kidnapped his wife, and authorities believe he may now be in Florida. In our second special alert case, another family has been shattered by a kidnapping. The victim is a 65-year-old woman who suffers from severe asthma and must have daily medication. Martha Doe Roberts and her husband, Alan, lived in Eads, Tennessee, 25 miles from Memphis. Alan last saw his wife when he left for work at 9.30 a.m. on August 7, 1992. When he returned later in the afternoon, his wife was gone. That night, Alan Roberts received a ransom call. A muffled male voice demanded $100,000 or threatened he would split open Martha's head. The kidnapper has made no further contact. If Doe is released unharmed, I will meet any demand. I will do whatever is necessary to obtain her release. Next week on Unsolved Mysteries, Senator Huey Long of Louisiana. In his day, the most fascinating character in American politics. But in 1935, Long died in a flurry of gunfire in his own state capital. History records that his assassin, Dr. Carl Weiss, was killed almost instantly by the senator's bodyguards. Today, there is mounting evidence that Dr. Weiss may have been innocent and that the truth may have been shrouded by a cover-up. Join me next time. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery.
Thank you.